Right, okay, great. <clears throat> so, I'm Steve, I'm living here in the mountains of the west of Ireland, uh, but I've been using this material now for about 25 years, and uh, I've gained a lot of experience in a wide variety of ways of using it. So, uh, that has led me to hold events and become the director of the International Hemp Building Association, which has uh, collated and collected a, a, a large amount of information through presentations and research, uh, and that we... I uh, try to promote this in a sustainable way as possible throughout the world. Wonderful. Thank you. And Steve Allen is also the author of the book, uh, Building with Hemp, which is one of our foundations. So we're very thankful for all the work you've done over all these years, and we're very happy to have you here today. And um, and we have Jennifer Martin from Hempstone, who we heard from also earlier. Greetings. Hi, everyone. My name is Jennifer, and I live in Shelburne Falls, Massachusetts, and collect Collaboratively, I run Hempstone with Tom Ross Masler. We are a hemp creek company offering construction and supply throughout New England and consultation, training, and research throughout the United States. We obviously specialize in hemp creek with a name called Hempstone, but we also utilize other natural building materials as well to create healthy, high performing, resilient buildings. I got my start in hempcrete just a couple years ago after the US Farm Bill uh, made hemp legal. But that is on the back of 20 plus years of being a natural design builder. I was one of the few people that had the luxury of just playing with natural building materials exclusively, which is super exciting. And one of the things that really attracts me to hempcrete is it's for potential for creating um, bio-based um, buildings using local, renewable, abundant materials. And though we're still at the bleeding edge of that, it is coming. So let's talk about that today. Yes, please, let's do that. Um, and to be able to talk about how we're going to um, scale hemp building, we're going to have to talk about the challenges and the issues that we've seen in the past that we can improve upon. So um, Alex, can we start with you? Um, what is the most common uh, difficulty that you've come across um, in hemp building? Uh, well, I mean, in terms of scaling up, I think the, the biggest challenge is that hempcrete or hemp uh, lime construction as a whole is a very uh, different material to conventional construction materials that we've been using on both sides of the pond for the last uh, 50, 60 years. Um, yes. It has some similarities um, with, with materials that are familiar to, to construction teams from both sides of the Atlantic, but it, as a material, it behaves in a very different way. So um, the way that it uh, allows moisture vapor to pass through the wall assembly um, is fairly unique in modern construction. Um, and it also um, behaves uh, thermally extremely well, but in a different way to conventional insulation materials that are used in modern construction. So um, one of the, you know, many challenges arise from that. And if you'd have asked me the same question 10 years ago, um, I think probably the biggest challenge was that it was at the time a relatively um, novel material. You know, I mean, in, in this country, in the UK, we've been using hemp in construction, hempcrete in construction for about 22 years, something like that now. Um, before that, it was used in on mainland Europe. Um, so I think uh, part of the issue back then was really just um, the, the kind of awareness of it as a material within the industry. Um, and then today, I think that that's improved, but um, there are lots of challenges arising from its increased use so as as it begins to be used by a wider and wider um, section of the industry there's um, issues around um, different methods of application and um, whether those require specialist skills and knowledge or not um, and also uh, proving the performance of hemp lime um, in comparison to existing materials that people are used to using. 
Got it. Awesome. So from what I understand that initially it was more of a social challenge, right? That people or builders or architects weren't familiar with it. But now that the, the good word is spread, um, we're looking at the application. So um, Jennifer, with that, and when it comes to like the trainings that you do, um, what's your perception when it comes to um, perhaps standardizing education and application or, um, you know, minimal basic base level edu uh, education necessary? What would you say is necessary to ensure that um, the buildings are sound and um, it's, it's uh, performing the way that it should? Um, great question. First of all, Alex, what you said about where you were at 10 years ago and where you're at now, I'm feeling both those for sure. Although we don't have the same sort of ex, um, expansive adoption of hempcrete, but uh, the installation methods certainly have, are, are coming into play. And for us at Hempstone, we're about to install our first block um, installation next week on Monday. And we're in communication with several different clients about Panelize. So we've, we're about to explore all four different installation methods. And we just hosted a four day introductory and advanced training on hempcrete and lime plaster. We got to talk about some of those installation methods. And certainly when I'm thinking about hempcrete, because we've moved beyond the cast in place, which is the easiest to explain and to help have people understand it's, this, it's the easiest entry point to get into hempcrete. Uh, it does create a question of what is our responsibility as the US Hemp Building Association to educate about the, the pros and cons of all the different installation methods? Because when I'm looking at a project, I'm talking to the client and the contractor um, about and the designer about their full project criteria. And sometimes, uh, well, off, all the time, really, the method of installation is going to be dictated by that project criteria, by those main stakeholders. And if we're only teaching or talking about one style of installation rather than the variety of installation methods, we're somewhat putting um, putting the cart before the horse. Uh, and yet we are in an interesting position because we are, it is still a novel material in the United States. I'm still explaining what hempcrete is. I'm still trying to explain how it's not concrete. And so it's this, it's this double, it's this double um, pathway, both at the same time to educate and inform and build up manufacturing and processing in order to have an entire industry. So we're definitely behind the power curve, but we have this advantage of all this institutional understanding and knowledge from around the world. And we're, um, we're starting to invest collectively as a nation in processing facilities, in manufacturing facilities. So all four are coming into play. We already have spray machines here in the United States, a variety of different spray machines. We have panelization companies that are trying to come on. We have block, install, um, block manufacturing that's trying to come online. So it is valuable to be talking about hempcrete not simply as a cast in place methodology, but as a robust and versatile and diverse um, biocomposite that can be used in a variety of different contexts. Definitely, for sure. And when it comes to those different contexts, I'll get to you, Corbett, here shortly regarding the process of that. Um, but Steve, um, I think you've been doing it the longest. Uh, what, when it comes to the actual, Okay, well, let, me, let me think about how I'm going to phrase this. Um, your experiencing is your experience is mainly in cast in place, is that correct? Uh, well, I've uh, probably done every different type. I've done quite a lot of spraying as well. In fact, I was one of the okay. uh, people who first uh, uh, looked into what Lauren Gooday was doing in France with the first spray machines, and and, uh, and he helped me build one here in Ireland. But uh, I've also been somebody who's been eager to promote the other systems. And they all have benefits and uh, and so, some some slight disadvantages, but that's another application system that uh, is is uh, easily adopted. The blocks are, are as uh, uh, have all sorts of 
potential in the different designs and methods that blocks can be used. Um, panels are being already done in a variety of different countries in very different ways, but all using hemp materials in some way or other materials that could either be replaced by hemp or work perfectly well alongside it. And uh, all these systems have great relevance when it comes to new building. Mm -hmm. But a, a lot of what needs to be done is retrofitting existing houses. And so that, you know, that, that's something that, that uh, isn't maybe as glamorous. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, we can uh, have these fantastic sort of you know, glossy portraits of these amazing residences uh, that, you know, look absolutely per paradisical. Um, that's, that, that, that's great, but there are a lot of people who just need housing, you know, and uh, a lot of people who are already in housing who, if they could Im improve it, it, would be worth living in, you know, and or it would be worth buying because it's just a shell and they know how to make that shell into something a lot better. And uh, so, you know, it could be areas of a lot of places, of cities and other places that need regeneration, that there are existing structures that need to be retrofitted. And, you know, most people are living in buildings that are going to still be there. They're not going to be living in buildings that are going to be new. Uh -huh. yeah. That's only a small percentage of the population, but at the same time, it's a huge market, judging mm -hmm. by all the estimations that people and politicians and people make for all around the world. Every nation seems to have a housing crisis. Mm -hmm. And as I said in my presentation, there are estimates of America needing something like five and a half million new houses. Well, that's, you know, <laughs> I don't know about what period of time that's supposed to be happening, but it, it's a lot slower than people think to build houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear that. I feel like we're opening up all these different boxes and it's kind of just a matter of where we're going to focus when it comes to the challenges because um, we're trying to build up the industry um, for adoption. But like we've mentioned, there's so many different applications and each kind of need their own R&D. Um, the house you're sitting in looks so wonderful. It's, it's a temperature, nice and well, that's, comfortable. No, that's, this is my office. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, it's my office in my weird prototype building. Yeah. So um, when it comes to this r and I guess you can say when it uh, pertaining to the different applications, I don't know who wants to go for this, but um, where do you all see is the best focus um, to be able to encourage wider spread adoption? Is it... Uh, a retrofits is it just doing individual cast in place until the blocks are ready or the fabricated panels are um at that stage i don't know where do you guys feel is uh the most efficient place to focus when it comes to education and standardizing um standardizing the education i guess well architects need to be educated that's a very important that has to be a, you know it, presented to the schools of architecture that their their modules for most of their education is way out of date and it's appalling they have very little uh, you know broad education about natural materials or sustainable materials or building in you know, the reality that we are living in but uh, i think that the main focus needs to be on establishing hemp production because without that you're not going to have anything and okay. so, you know, as I mentioned in my presentation, you know, this is supposed to be a building association and I keep talking about farming. But that, uh -huh. that, that, uh, that combination and that link, whether it's on a small scale between a few farmers that are involved in some small scale uh, food oil production or something and need to have some kind of a rotation crop like hemp, who get together some crew processing which supplies five or six of their mates that are doing renovations on buildings that they know how to use this stuff and the clients are quite happy because well they're friends of theirs or relatives or whatever so that isn't something that is necessarily about codes but when it comes to if we're really going to want to get industrial then I, from my experience uh, trying to develop loads of unique machines is really expensive and that if we want to do this quickly, there are a lot of existing processing, especially machinery that has a cost, but that cost it means guaranteed materials. It means a guaranteed output. It means that you can build a real industry around it. 
Uh-huh. And there is bound to be, as a, as one of the productions of that, materials that can be for retrofit or, or self-build or whatever, that's going to be a byproduct, if you like. But the real possibility now is that we can design all kinds of different factories that a bale of hemp goes in one end and a house comes out the other or any of the components of a house come out the other all together as one house. It's all those things are easily possible. We can say, right, we can use that there, that there, that there, and that there. Some of those technologies like the, the hemp fiber board uh, flooring and stuff that's been developed in America are very much American ideas, but there are a lot of other composite boards, um, uh, panel systems, uh, blocks, all sorts of stuff that have been developed in other parts of the world that could easily be adopted. And it would mean that we can do this quickly because uh, you know, uh, sort of having these five, 10 year plans, like yeah, we're really in a bit more of a rush than that. And I think there is so much momentum now around the world to to do something <laughs> and to, to provide some solutions uh, that you know, we can, we're, we're gonna have to persuade people who want to invest in, in doing just that and trying to link the farmers, the builders and the people within a community. Definitely, definitely. With that, I was going to pitch it over to uh, Corbett Hafner, who is our processing um, specialist here, but uh, for some reason he got kicked off. So um, we will continue the conversation. Um, so when it comes to processing and um, the speculations of the herd, um, are any of you familiar as to um, I guess, um, the formulations, is there a variance when it comes to blocks or cast in place or the prefabricated panels for this processed material? Yeah, I think it will depend very much on the end user. And there are certain, the, the more techni- technologically advanced uh, methods of application, whether that be um, spray application or or um, sort of forming hemp into blocks. Some of those work a lot better with a particular um, specification of processed hemp herd. Um, That is always uh, um, a kind of uh, conversation probably at the stage you're at in the States between the processor and the end user at this stage. Um, And I think it's something that I know the USHBA are working on is is to develop a, a sort of ideal specification for hemp herd, and that maybe um, end up being more than one specification uh, for different uses um, within hempcrete applications as a whole. Um, I think it's important as you develop that standard to to base that on a, on evidence from from the last thirty years in Europe about what works well and. Uh, what doesn't in terms of herd specification. But I think there's a danger in um, making the specification too narrow uh, or too too specific because you may well, um, you know, at this stage you're wanting to develop the industry. So, so for example, someone who's shuttering and casting may be able to get away with a, a slightly, what we might term a slightly rougher grade of hemp than someone who's using a, a high-tech, spray application method so it's it's important to sort of develop continue to work with producers and processors and develop that specification and keep working to make um you know at, to have the hemp herd meet minimum standards at least and to keep improving the the quality whilst not being exclusive and um, cutting new people out of um uh you know new processors out of the game I'd just like to add that in uh, the IHBA has a best practice guide, and in that we do uh, have a graph and diagram expressing the different particle sizes that we consider to be suitable, and that at the same time are available. What's available and what's suitable for what? What you also have to remember about this is that most early versions of hemp building weren't done by uh, pre- wanting a precise thing from the hemp industry it was that the technology that hemp industry was using to, p- to process their material was providing or producing a particular material and so that's what we learned to use now when it comes to hemp herd 
it was more about keeping it, having it clean so there wasn't a load of dust in it. But particle sizes were basically defined by the machinery that processes it. So the, the, the only time that you end up with particles sizes that are vastly different from that is if you're going with prototype type machinery. Yeah. And so if you're going to have machinery that that cleans the fiber enough to be for the fiber to have a market value, then you end up with a particular processing which produces herd at a particular rate. You know? Yeah, I think I'd qualify that a little bit, Steve. What you're saying is right, but I think uh, one of one of the issues is that the herd is certainly in the in the UK is uh, I would say now a co-product of the fiber market but it originally was a, a waste product from the fiber market um right. but the in the varieties that are grown in the uk the the herd is um the greater portion of the biomass that's harvested but but a lower value portion so people tend to um process according to what the end use and the and the market for the fiber is because that's their their high value um, yeah. bit of the crop. So we've noticed differences in um, particle size and also the amount of, of fines, the amount of uh, bast fiber that's left in the product, depending what the end use of the fiber is. Right. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. So, it does, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and, and uh, I've noticed there was a question um, earlier saying, is there a a, a, does a specification exist in the UK for uh, hemp herd for for hempcrete or hemp blocks? And it doesn't really. No, there's no standardised formal specification at the moment, and that's really just a reflection of where we are in the process. Um, you, you know, in as an industry in the UK, um, in France there has been for a long time a um, a sort of a top down specification of what building herd should be like um but i haven't i haven't worked in that market but i've i've used and seen samples of uh, french hemp um and you know it, it it's always very clean it's always a consistent color um i think that that's you know to do with, with the way that they process it in in france um i i i know that hemp which you know we there's a there's a broadly within the industry in the uk uh there is a an informally agreed sort of set of parameters for what hemp herd should be like and jennifer's is showing us some french french herd i think yeah can <laughs> um so uh i think that um you know there's a generally agreed um sort of standard within users in the industry but i i know for a fact that that hempcrete, successful hempcrete, can be made with um, hemp herd that is that sits outside of that um, quite prescriptive specification that's available uh, in in French producers. What's your um, what have you found, Jennifer? Because I know you've experimented with a range of different herds from a range of different sources. Well, so this is my cute little hemp library. It's so good. It's like all these different things. And what's most interesting to me is not necessarily the European herd because, yeah, you know, you got it going on. I get that. That's great. Like here, this, for example, is some um, Dunagro. It's kind of small for Dunagro, but it's some Dunagro. That's from the Netherlands. But what's really exciting is to watch and see what's happening here in the States. So this is a Western States hemp herd that I just got given a couple weeks ago. Check that out. And this is the Hempville out of North Carolina. And they got, they got some variability in their hemp sizes. And this is not fully processed. This is straight off their cut machine and they can sieve it down more if I want a different specification in terms of variability in my, in my herd sizes. And I've been, here's an example of some Canadian stuff, a lot of variability, check that out. That's some nice variability. But what's really interesting is when I'm talking with new processors and they're showing me their initial set that kind of looks like this, 
and then we talk more about what hemp is about and it can shift and they can adapt their processing to meet more of what I'm looking for as a, as a contractor, either in terms of dust or in terms of particle size in particular. Um, and that's really exciting. And sometimes it means doing some really experimental stuff. This is CBD herd from literally down the street from where I live. We cut this with a um, Vermeer chipper shredder and I would not recommend it as a productivity thing because we had 90% waste to get to this 10% herd. But it was interesting to see that we took all these different herds we bound them together in blocks and then we had them tested at the University of Massachusetts. Now we only did our value testing. We didn't do compression strength. We didn't do anything else. Um, but we learned that whether you're talking about CBD hemp, European hemp, American sunflower, which is also what we did. We did some sun choke, um, all the same R value. So fascinating and different particle sizes still still work still knit together just anecdotal evidence but super fun well that uh, you, were, you you were showing me those different examples from the us a lot of that is down to the actual stem size the, the, this kind of range of particle sizes you're talking about so it's like it's much more about uniformity of growing and preventing yeah. and presenting a very uniform material to the processing which will then give you a more uniform material that's yeah. that's one of the real challenges of entering natural materials into the kind of processing that we've developed is that mo a lot of the processing we've developed is been about synthetic materials which you create by setting the machinery at a particular point turning the on switch and out comes that polyester fiber or whatever it might be whereas natural fibers you are bound to have all these variations you're going to have variations of different years you're going to have variations of different soils different fertility different uh, processing and storage all those kinds of things are going to have an, a, a, an impact but hopefully they would only have a slight impact and there are main things like the, the 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 moisture content of material before it's bagged, things like that are probably more important. The compression within any kind of packaging that, that might make it difficult to uncompress when using it. But when it comes to products, that uniformity of product, well, that's something that only can only really happen when you've got the hemp production. And to start at some level so that you can go then you've got a lot of options you can go to panels you can go to modular housing you can go to insulation uh, rolls and materials that can all be added on to that that major uh, processing thing and that's when you need to be in the right kind of farming area near to the right kind of population sizes that you can you can you know, you've got a big enough market definitely no and point, with no that we have a huge uh, factory in the middle of nowhere you know Yes, yes. And that, with that, we have Corbett Hefner, who is a co-partner in uh, Formation Ag, which does processing. And they're based in Colorado, which is in the middle of a good amount of uh, hemp. So, um, Corbett, can you describe to us uh, your guys' current uh, status when it comes to processing and um, the interest, I guess, in the herd from Formation Ag for building specifically? Sure, right. Yeah, there, there's quite a bit of interest, actually. We get calls and emails every day asking for more and, and what can we do and what can we provide. But like Steve was just saying there, it, it, consistency and being able to size it so that it performs is really important. So, you know, working backwards to how it's farmed so that we can try and achieve that is, is a big deal. But, um, but we've been running more and more and more and learning about the different genetics and how they perform and what the sizes are. And, it's a little bit of a, of a learning curve still because some people want three inch pieces, some people want half inch pieces, some people want inch and a half or blend of. So we're still trying to learn. And, and we have the ability to change those sizes so we can, can meet that need of what's what, what they're asking for. But it'd be nice if there was just one standard that says, you know, this kind of particle size is, is a, an R value of X, but the variables because it is a natural product are so great it's, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to figure out how to make that consistently year in and year out area to area 
Yes, for sure. And so um, with that, and I know you spoke earlier regarding processing and um, you know the large scale or the small, more rural um, processing equipment for people to, I guess, you know, harvest their own farms. Um, do you see Colorado, for example, in um, for the states to be a place where um, we can potentially see that scale up uh, for farming? I mean, I guess the question is, sure. are farmers ready to um, plant for herd or for fiber? They are. We've got a few farms that have planted some crops that will harvest for herd. Um, mm -hmm. Denver, you know, being as close to Denver in the front range, there's a lot of building going on and has been, uh, and, and this is a more environmentally conscious area. So I think it's going to lend itself very nicely to these these kind of facilities. I, I'm a big fan of redundancy. I'd rather have a, a few lines running instead of one larger one. Uh, just being in manufacturing for 35 years, I just like having that redundancy and the flexibility. Um, I like Colorado also because it's a drier area. So the mold mildew issues are going to be less here, or you won't have to spend any any capital resources drying that product. Uh, not that you can't do that anywhere else, but it's just something I've thought about. Um, you know, I, I I just think this will be a great area for it. And then we do a lot of work in in the plains area too, which is also very very good uh, conducive area for farming this crop. And the farmers are going to be receptive to it because they want another rotation crop especially one that they can contribute in from a value added means of, of having these processors local to, you know, maybe a handful of these different farms use these machines in their region. And I, and I think they're willing at this point in time to participate so that they they kind of break out of some of the paradigms of the greenery model that, that they've been stuck with for a long time here. Yep. Sure. So a lot of rural remote America and Australia desperately need those kind of solutions. On the mm -hmm. east side of the country and in Europe, we're a lot more closer together. Well, in Europe, we're really close together. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. we're a bit so spread out here. <laughs> My nearest neighbor is a mile. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that can end, add a lot of expenses to things. So you, you do need to think about yep. scale in, in that way. Yep. For sure. So um, when it comes to regional variances, um, anybody can jump on this. Um, is this more of a experienced, you know, hemp builder uh, skill to be able to uh, adopt or adapt to the different region when it comes to the moisture level, um, different climates and that kind of thing? Um, what's the biggest challenge that you guys have found uh, building in a region that you're not familiar with, I guess you could say. Is it weather? Is it, um, again, just the, the natural material sourcing, that kind of thing? Um, yeah, what, what, what are the challenges think, you face? If I can start on that one, I think um, the this is an interesting question because some of the application methods are more suited to certain climates. So um, a lot of us have spent a lot of time wet casting on site, casting hempcrete buildings in situ, uh, whether that's by shuttering and placing hempcrete within formwork or by spray applying. Um, that is uh, really the simplest form of hempcrete construction and provides a very high level of air tightness and insulation to the building. Um, but one of the biggest, uh, you know, the much talked about challenges of building with hempcrete in that way is the drying time on site. So um, you guys have got some really great, uh, well, you've got a lot of different climactic regions around the US, but uh, included in that eight, according to Jennifer, thank you. Um, but within that, included within that is a lot of really great hempcrete drying uh climate or weather um but certainly one of the um the challenges uh, in the uk which is famously sort of damp and gray and uh, we we do have some nice days but they're kind of scattered throughout the year um one of the issues that we has always been in the forefront of our mind is um when we're casting buildings is how you get those dry um especially within the build schedule if people need to be in by the end of the year 
Um, and that, as you get further north, uh, that becomes increasingly difficult because the, the weather gets colder. Um, you know, the, the, the climate is colder, rather. Um, Steve, anything to add on that? I, I have heard, just to finish that point, I have had queries from builders in Australia saying, what do you do when the hemp creek cracks because it's drying out too quickly? And uh, my response to that is I've never had that problem <laughs> here. But uh, I'd love the opportunity to go and work in a place where that was an issue. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, uh, I, 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 have done, like, I have been lucky enough to do that in Australia and I was doing it in Texas as well, you can see both very hot climates but i've also worked in tropical regions in costa rica and haiti and that is a completely different atmosphere and nepal again with the huge range of, of crudity of materials sometimes and uh, and the fact that you're you're uh, uh, dealing with it with a, a limited time in some places that you can actually build or get to anywhere so th there's all sorts of different aspects to it but i've found that there's also a lot of similarities and that it's a bit of an intuition as well. Once you have worked with the material, as in hempcrete, in in any sort of, of the earlier forms, like just hand casting, you get the feel of it. You get to know, okay, what it's like, just like you might do if you're a, a casting with concrete uh, from a, when you were a child, even and were helping your uncle or grandfather or whatever. You got sort of an idea of how it worked, and then the same with a, a lot of other materials that that you start to to, um, to know that well, okay, if it for the rain for a, for, the, for a couple of hours, it's not the end of the world because well, if we had to stop working here in Ireland every time it rained, we'd never get anything done. So we got used to, okay, how does it work? So maybe we were able to put less water in it. However, when I was working in America, in Australia, and it was a very hot and suburban location, and I thought, right, well, we, you know, we're going to need to stop this drying out too quickly. So we're going to need to wet the hemp first before we put the binder on it so that the, bind, the hemp's not sucking too much of the water out of the binder. That was just an intuitive thing. And, and I would say that that's probably still what I would do if I was working in Australia, especially during the hot season. So there are other implications of working in tropical regions. The man, I can't remember his name, who built, who built the house in Florida, he was buying a product that developed in Europe and that is based on, on a cement element to it, the Tradical. And Tradical needs an amount of water to set, but, you know, to, to have that chemical set. Otherwise, if it doesn't have enough water, it doesn't work properly. And the other thing about Tradical is that when it was devised, again, getting back to the thing of like, well, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Did the material get specified for the product or did the product become specified because of the material? That when they were bagging, then the company Balthazar Coat, BCB in, in Besançon, were bagging their early versions of Tradical under their own label. They had bags that were a certain size. The material when filled in that bag weighed 22 kilos. So they thought, right, for a, for a 20 kilo bag of hemp, you use two bags of, of, of binder because their thing was to sell the binder. And it's taken years and years for the amount of that binder to be reduced and therefore the amount of water. But when the house was built in Florida, the, the direction was to use quite a strong mix and to put enough water to make that work. And being in a tropical environment, it took forever to dry out. And those are all you know, things that, that we need to develop, but that you know, referring to experts who've seen different, different, different uh, situations can, can cut those sort of corners. It's not as if the knowledge isn't out there. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. It's more so um, skill and experience, right? From seeing this, this variation. Um, so is there anything that either of you, maybe we have enough time to, to do a quick round of uh, perhaps some challenges and solutions that we can develop in moving forward? Jennifer, do you want to start? I see you. Sure, I'll start. I love it. Um, okay, so I see our, so we're talking about a nascent building industry, a new building material, at least in the United States. Bear with me. I know y'all have been doing this for a long time. You're old hats. I get it. But we're new. So I love what Bob Asher says. Bob's an architect out of Vermont. He was the first founding president of the USHBA, and we're close. We are geographically close. 
And I'm a builder primarily, he's an architect primarily. So we dovetail beautifully together. We also present at different um, events together. We're gonna teach at Yes Tomorrow next year. I'm super excited. Yes Tomorrow Design Build School. Doesn't get any better than that. And that speaks to my point, which is that how often do we get to introduce a new building material and especially a building material that is able to address the most critical issue in our lifetime, which is carbon in the atmosphere. And we have an opportunity with this material, despite all the challenges, to sort of transcend the individual logistics challenges of, oh, I can only get material here and I can only do this because it is a compelling biocomposite. It does something that can fundamentally change the building paradigms. And that is exciting. And if we're, you know, as we're coalescing our energy around that and we're, and we're promoting it and we're talking about it and teaching it, it, the, the, the impacts, the profound impact impacts are actually beyond our true comprehension. And it's that little nugget of hope and inspiration and excitement and curiosity and joy that will propel and compel us to overcome any challenge that any of these gentlemen now talk about. So we'll make it through, just keep the vision in sight. <laughs> Yeah. And, and I think um, based off of your project management um, presentation earlier, uh, the huge portion in regards to collaboration, right? There's so many different avenues in which we're trying to figure out. So collaborating with the processors or um, the architects and that whole range. I think uh, there's no clear cut path forward. Um, but we're well, there are many, many yeah. paths forward. That, that's what I was going to say, but no one, right? Possibly so two, too many. But I think <laughs> when you talk about challenges, I think uh, the, the narrower challenge is in certainly in where I live in the world, and I would imagine it would be becoming that in the US is that where are we going to find people to work on building sites? Because in Labor. the UK and to a certain extent in Ireland, the uh, average age of builders is now 54. I, I would like and to uh, feel that. That that's to me is just out. astounding. So we need builders. We need to. Uh, uh, we need to be able to attract young men and women into this industry to, to actually do the building, to make it a pleasant experience, a fun experience, and a rewarding experience. And then we need to do what you referred to at the beginning, Jennifer, as the biggest, the biggest thing we need to do anywhere in the world is somehow convince people who are uh, not convinced as yet that climate change is real and that we really have to do something about the way we're totally reliant on fossil carbon and transferring into a realistic version of the future that is based on renewable carbons. And there is you know, uh, a great potential that we can do that, but it's it's a huge, we're, we're just part of, of that. But we could also be quite a vocal part of it because we have such a very solid solution that's very easily understood by people. And it can, if we can find the better, best and better ways of, of transmitting that information, you know, uh, we have a lot of advantages because it is hip to start with. And because it's, yeah, it really works. <laughs> you will find very few people living or operating in buildings that have any complaints about the way it works. Definitely. And I think, I think, Steve, what you know, the, what we've been talking about tonight are, are the different application methods and the different ways of using hemp and the different. Um, the differences in materials that are produced, whether that be the binder or the herd in different regions around the world. And um, as Jennifer was saying, you know, with the, through the collaborations that we all work um, through with our own practice, people are constantly evolving new methods and new formulations, new, new are, natural yeah. building products. Um, and there's a kind of a tension between that on the one hand and for certified 
building materials or products to be produced on on the other hand so you've got this constantly innovating space but also the need to um to prove those materials in the um wider construction market but i think it we should give equal um weight and we should give e equal effort to all of those different application methods because in the range from you know mixing in a in a drum mixer and casting in formwork around a a stick frame to uh, prefabricated panels. Um, you know, you've got everything from the the two man, two person crew on the corner building their own uh, addition to the robotic, you know, offsite construction methods of, of the future. You know, so I think it it's really po the really positive thing to take away is that that hempcrete works equally well in all of those um sort of um in in all of those contexts definitely and i would like to think that um getting people trained and enthusiastic to uh fill that labor shortage shouldn't be too difficult um ideally ushba and organizations like us can be the 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 pr arm for um, getting the word out once we, you know, make these steps and organize more. Um, but Corbett, can you please share with us what are the challenges in getting more farmers to grow hemp or um, getting processing facilities up? And I mean, I guess also there's a the processing within itself is a huge range when it comes to equipment and methodologies and all that kind of stuff. So what would you say the biggest challenge is to, let's not say f 5 million homes in the next X you know, five days, but um, to scale at a quicker rate? Um, is it the farmers? Is it the processing? Yeah. I think farmers are very accepting and willing to, to grow it. They just want to make sure that that, that the crop's going to get sold and they're going to get paid for it. Um, I think one of the bigger things is having the foresight to, to right now start writing contracts if, if and, and, it, and like you said a minute ago, chicken and egg thing, you, you've got, we got to create more demand for the product so we can go back and contract these acres because there's so many, there's only so many uh, viable bales of material laying around that we can process right now. And we're gonna, we may or may not run out of those before the 2022 harvest. So we need to start thinking ahead, you know, do we need 100,000 pounds for the next XYZ projects or do we need 10 million pounds? so that we can back that into acres of, of crop that needs to be produced because you just you do have a, a annual uh, event where you have to plant this stuff and harvest it and get it off the ground so planning that far in advance is, is going to be something that we got to start thinking about so that we make sure we have the right supply you know if you start something up and then you run out of material it's kind of hard to say you're a great industry so we need to make sure we can have an uninterrupted supply of that product so i mean there, there's people farming it but performance is it in the right spot is it the right genetic is it going to break down and, and be a usable product a lot of a lot of the, the devil in the details things we've got to figure out and make sure we can keep this all rolling because it's just not that available at, at this point in time i'm sure there's stuff out there but what is it it's the, the, end, the end what problem you put it in, the and in America. Then correct yep we got to get those acres in and and have demand for them so that so that the the whole financial model works for everybody yeah and I how do you yeah, part of the financial plan has to be the, the 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 stash of money if you like the cash flow for the first two years where you definitely pay the farmers yes. so if you're definitely paying oh, the yeah, farmers then they're, then they're producing it then they're also going to be encouraged by the fact that you're that, that they're actually you're know, seeing the factory being built Yes, they know you're definitely going to be buying yep. into the future. But, but as you say, you've definitely paid the farmers for the right material, not the crappy material, but you were able to show them within the first year or two how you want that material presented because that's an incredibly important aspect to how efficient the, the processing is, is how it's presented. Absolutely. And also for the further markets, and if we're going to get into large markets for fibre, then you have to have a, a quite complex processing system, which is why the ones that are available predominantly from France or Britain, you know, they work. <laughs> you put a bale in one end and quality fibre that's very well separated and, 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 and clean enough to make 
insulation or biocomposite stuff for which are very big markets and the herd is clean enough and packaged in such a way as to be ideal for building or bedding and those are the two major markets for that so that you're immediately into those markets so there's no uncertainties it's doing doing it other ways the fiber processing is becomes a difficult bit and you end up with a huge amount of fiber you've got to do something with that <laughs> it can be quite right. inflammable if you're not careful yes it's correct yeah finding homes for all of the products you know when we run a, a ton of material we end up with roughly five different sized either fiber three different herds could be four different herd sizes and then two fibers yeah so you, you really need to find viable uses for all of those two so we're still in a in a an upswing in, in learning where we can sell that and uh, what we can do with it and finding markets for all of that is really key yep. so it's all intertwined like you said cash flow in this for the next 12 24 36 months is going to be kind of a a little bit of a challenge. That we need a lot be, of visionaries yeah, here. The plan. Um, practical, financial, and other supports available. Um, I'll, I'll let you guys have that conversation perhaps after in a private chat. Um, but as we mentioned here, there's just um, the whole range in regards to uh, figuring out the solutions and I mean, just from what I'm hearing at the end of the day, it really does come down to collaboration and communication and working together to um, address each of these steps, whether it's the specification, the processing, um, the building, the education, that whole range. So um, we're really thankful for you guys all being here. That's our goal here at the USHBA is to bring, bring us together. And um, I hope here within the next year let's just set a goal that we can um get some more concrete things or some more hemp lime construction things on paper and out to the masses um thank you all for being here today we appreciated this talk and um we're going to wrap it up now appreciate you all thanks Saba. Oh, no.